Well, I'm just going to give a quick presentation about the people's land policy. The title of the last three seminars in the series is Land Justice for and by the People. Um, the land, land justice for us uh, links back to this famous quote from Wynne Stanley about the whole idea of what is land for. Is it for a few people to profit from or should it be for the benefit of all of us? So we believe the idea of land we've grown up. In other words, hmm. that the ideas about what we should be doing and how we're going to transform the system need to come from people on the ground who are experiencing the consequences of who owns it, controls it, has access to it, makes decisions about it, are all underlie so many different issues that without even being aware of it, people often talk about land, but they don't realize that something that the land issues are something they come across every day, wherever they live, whether it be in the countryside or in the city. So it could be to do with how we treat the natural environment and climate change, housing and um, solidarity. It could be spaces for recreation or issues to do with access to quality food and water. Um, so the People's Land Policy is a project, and I say project, um, really to develop discussion and debate about what kind of land reform we need. So through the a number of initiatives that we've taken over the years, but in particular recently through the seminar series, we've been bringing together a range of people to discuss land and the issues that affect them. And we would like to feel that we're contributing to the building of a broad-based movement for land justice, which is why this particular seminar is so important, because it is about how do we actually build on that, that we believe that land is, is such a, a big system, it includes everything, that therefore we need a kind of holistic approach to how we deal with it. We also see land as a commons, in other words, that it is a source of wealth that belongs to all, and also the importance of the concept of stewardship, looking after and caring for that land. And another part of that vision, which is particularly important for this particular series, is that decisions about land must be fully participatory, democ democratic and inclusive. It's not something that can come out of think tanks. It's not something that can be imposed on people by the market or the state. It's things that must come from the people themselves. They must be involved in making these decisions. So how we've been developing the people's land policy is to gather a range of ideas and then develop our people's land policy document, which is on our website, um, based on what we've learned. We've had two updates that we need to incorporate based on some of these seminars already. Um, and we want to work with others and campaign for change, which could also include a land reform act. The past the two seminar series we've had already, so the Land and Environment had three seminars, Land and Food had four that we held over the past year and a half. And uh, with really literally hundreds attending. And uh, this current one is, uh, is, on, is on participatory democracy land decision making. Um, so up till now, the two, that we've had in this series have been about disparate democracy itself and how it works in the UK. But tonight, we're actually focusing on the big question, how do we bring all of this together and to build a movement? And this is very important because people have come to seminars, for example, on the environment, and they've been personally involved in environmental activities. People might have come to the land and food one because they're involved in a community garden or in some kind of growing activity. But really, if we're going to build a movement about land, we have to incorporate people who are involved in all these different movements and struggles. It's not enough. People cannot just remain in their own campaign and their own particular area of struggle if we're going to actually make any serious big changes 
systemic changes. People keep saying in all these seminar series that what we need is systemic change. Well, this is not going to come about if we don't somehow come together to build a movement which is very strong because people who have the power now aren't about just to give it up without there being a mass movement to challenge the, the current situation. So I'm going to hand over now to Gabriella, who's going to introduce our three speakers. Hello, everyone. It's very good to have everyone here. I'm so grateful to be here and also be able to introduce all the speakers of today's seminar. I was myself, I was a panelist on the participatory democracy, uh, the first seminar. So it was great to be able to share a little bit of my, my expertise, my background as, as a Brazilian researcher focused on conflicts related to land and their colonial legacies. So today what I'm doing here is to convene basically a transnational solidarity movement, a very important articulation that we need to keep doing. And I'm more than thrilled to basically introduce the three speakers that we have today. I'm gonna to go through their bios and then I'll call uh, Tiago, which will be our first one to speak. And Tiago, it's, it's an amazing person, amazing human being. You will see very shortly. And he's also one of the founders of the Movimento do Bem Viver, which is an eco-socialist initiative based in Brazil, my, my current home country, right, where I'm based at. So the Movimento do Bem Viver organized a collective work to regenerate forests through agroforest techniques, fighting agribusiness and showing different ways of producing while also regenerating and developing community projects here in the suburb suburbs of the big cities while also participating in the defense of indigenous and Kilobola communities in the Amazon, Cerrado, which is our savanna, and other biomes uh, here in our country, which currently we have uh, nine different biomes only in Brazil. So I'm very, very happy to receive Tiago here, and I'm amazed to be just waiting to know what he's going to share with you today. So yeah, I'll be calling you shortly, Tiago. Also, we have uh, Kate Swait, Swat, I think, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. She's from Shared Asset, Assets, and Shared Assets has been at the forefront of building a movement for land justice. And they helped to organize the Land for What conference and have also recently undertaken a project on how to build a land just, mo justice movement. So thank you so much for your time, Kate. I'm very excited to hear what you share with us today. And last but not least, I have also uh, Karima Mohidnin, which is, she's from London Mining Network, which is also a network that I collaborate um, as a researcher and as an activist uh, in the defense of human rights and nature rights. So London Mining Networks uh, works in solidarity with communities affected by uh, British mining companies and that are basically listed in the London Stock Exchange and its subsidiary, which is the alternative investment market. So LMN, it's made up of a very diverse group of people with very different political views and different uh, religious backgrounds as well, including no, none. But we are all working together in formal and informal networks to support communities fighting against mining. So we are here united basically by a shared commitment to challenge and calling the mining industry to, to be held accountable, right? which means that we need to put uh, the people's priorities in the forefront of our struggle as well. So yes, that's it. And I'm very, very happy to call Tiago to share a little bit more about his movement. Welcome, Tiago. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here and I appreciate the invitation. It's great to be part of an initiative to build a movement, right? To, to be able to see what you're doing there. Uh, I'm in Brazil and I'm actually part of this a process, similar process like this right now. And we just founded a movement, the Movimento Bem Viver. And it was very, very nice to be part of this. And I'm sure you're, go you're going to experience a great, a great uh, political construction right now. And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, well, I'm a, 35 year old environmentalist here. And I, it's been 16 years since I discovered the purpose of my life, which is be part of the social struggle of 
the uh, small part, a tiny little end, <laughs> as as a part of uh, the 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 struggles of our time. So we've really been creating a movement here, like for for at least six years, and we a lot of eco social eco socialist people here have been creating and gathering energy to create a movement here in Brazil. And we're very happy that this is happening now because now it's when we need the most. And Gabriela was talking about the situation here in Brazil and we're leaving the genocide and the ecocide as well. And I'm sure everyone is very well aware of that. So I'm not gonna <laughs> enter into that much <laughs> about the political situation here with Bolsonaro and the far, far right government here, but, but it's really terrible. And it's so terrible because it's tough to build a movement with so much depoliticization, so much criminalization. I am actually, I've been arrested two times this year only trying to prevent and to stop evictions for poor, poor people in the, during the pandemic here. And I have so many lawsuits from the government. I've been condemned the last week of, of one of them. And I've, I was sentenced to pay the, govern, the government agent who arrested me and it was very, very tough. The situation here in Brazil is very, very tough. But we're doing our best, not only to resist the genocide and the exide, but also to create alternatives. And that is why I'm so happy to talk about the, this right here, because we've been creating a movement based on the situation that we see the world here. And we see the world as a place of exploitation of oppressions and of the destruction of nature. And we see those three structural problems as very connected and interdependent between them, between themselves. Because the, the, the left here in Brazil is so fragmented and has so much diversity. In, 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 some, in some moments, this is very important, but there are some times when there's no synthesis and there's a left here who doesn't even understand that the oppressions, the race oppression, gender oppression, LGBTQIA oppression, and nationality and regionality oppression is part of the same struggle. Some people still have these very archaic ideas that this splits the, the working class and divides the movement. And there is something we do not believe at all because right here in, in such a, a country based on colonization, based on uh, social and space segregation in the cities in the country, is talk about oppression is part of our everyday basis. So we cannot talk about a revolution without considering the totality of the problems that are working class experiences. And also not only talk about oppression, but really do not give up on, on the class struggle and do not give up on talking about anti-capitalism because here the exploitation is so intense and people who talk about exploitations like it was a problem of only inequality here, but. Uh, here in, in Sao Paulo, for example, we have an industry here, a Johnson & Johnson industry, that uh, um, a, a worker there at the, the factory floor, she makes her own salary in 12 seconds, in a single day, in 12 seconds. And all the, all the other seconds, she's still working to, to complete a minute, and the other, other minutes, she's still working to complete an hour, and all the other hours, she's working to complete a shift, all the other shifts she's working to complete the day and the other days in the weeks until it completes the whole month and in 12 seconds she produces her own value in work. All the rest is producing plus value and profits for the owners of the, the production property, production means. So it's very, very unfair and so far beyond inequality because if you only talk about inequality, we would say, what if we, we double her salary? So it would be 24 seconds. What if we quadruple her salary? So it would be 48 seconds. Still uh, unbelievable, still absolutely unfair. So we have to talk about the property of the means. Then, and that's also the idea of, about talking about land. Here in Brazil, all the land was so concentrated, it was in the hands of 13 allies of the Portuguese court in Brazil, and it's still so concentrated. And we see here so much inequality. Brazil was, for, for like almost two decades, of, in, in four years ago, was still between the 10, the 10 biggest economies in the world based on GDP and all the other indicators. But we've always been between the 10 most unequal countries as well. So we have to talk about it. Exploitation here is so severe but it gathered, it becomes even more severe 
based on operations, but also the, the idea that all of this exploitation and operations is connected to the global environmental disaster, not only uh, global warming and climate emergency, but all the other um, limits that we have, the planetary boundaries and all those things that we experience here so intensively. And of course, who experience the most is the poorest people in the, in the suburbs, in the most precarious places in the cities, in the country, or in the forest, in the biomes. So based on this, we're trying to build a movement to fight all the three structural problems here. And it's tough to talk about it because 32 years ago, a, a wall fall, fell in, in Berlin and people said it was the end of history, Fukuyama and all those ideologies of, of capitalism, of new liberalism. But we've, we're trying here to gather energy every day more and more to talk about system change and to, to deal with this structural crisis of capitalism in a revolutionary way. And we, we, we use eco-socialism for that. We say that we need to create a revolution here. We need to, to change the way we produce things in order to save the planet, but also to, to eliminate the class division in our society here. And we need to do this and completely restructure the way we produce and reproduce life here on this planet. And by doing this, we are talking about a very severe democratic planning of everything we produce. We're talking about deciding everything, like how we're gonna face climate change, how we're gonna face all the, the planetary boundaries. And it's been really tough, but the, but the idea that we built a movement to deal with this strategy that since we live in a world full of exploitation, full of oppressions, and full of ecological destruction, we need to have a system change and to have to make this revolution happen. And especially here in the global south, which is so tough because of criminalization and all the all the capacity of coercion that the state has. And we're trying to do this in a strategy to build a different society here that, that we call the Buen Vivir Society. We call it Ben Vivir in Portuguese, but sometimes we are referring to the Buen Vivir based on the Quechua communities of Latin America, Quechua, especially based in Ecuador, but in other countries as well of Latin America. And they talk about Buen Vivir as a way of the balance of life and the abundance of life and, and and life as it's in its fullest, based on the way that we have our communitary ways of doing things. The, the, the basic idea of Buen Vivir is that, and the Quechua have the Summa Causa to say that, the, the, the Aymara people have Summa Camanha to say that, the Guarani people, which are based in Brazil and other five countries, they also have the Tecoporan to say that, which they say the Tecoporan is the beautiful, and, and pretty society that, which is built in, by the young Dereco, that is the communitary way of doing things. And many other people, originary people around the world talk about it. So we, we say that the Bantu speaking people in Africa talk about Ubuntu, and we have in India, Svadeshi, and we have, and in, in Chiapas, we have so many people saying the Zapatist community, saying ways to create a world where they, they, they can fit many worlds and have many, many places, those, those ideas. In Palestine, we have that with Sumut and the resistance there and the way of doing things communitarily. So we're trying to, to create a movement to build this society of Ben Vive. And we are trying to create a movement to, to make this strategy come true, to end exploitation and oppression and ecological destruction. And by doing this, we say that in each country, the eco-socialist strategy will have to be different. And in Brazil, we have to create a social majority. So this is basically our task right now. How do we create a social majority capable of doing this revolutionary act? And here, we are trying to do this by having a strategy that acts, acts in the cities, in the country, and in the biomes, in the forests especially. So we're trying to connect everything trying to connect all the struggles, never believing them as rivals of one another, of, of competitors of any type of mobilization, of, of financial search and any, any other things like that, or, or any social network visibility. They're, they're all together. We can't we can be victorious in any of them without the other ones. 
So we're trying to, to make the struggles work together in a totality movement, a movement that talks about a program for the whole society. And by doing this, we have to do not only in revolutionary theory, in having a program and having a strategy, but having things built from the ground up, a grassroots movement. So we're trying to do in the cities, for example, in the suburbs, we are creating what we call collective territories, which is a communitary initiative based on a communitary services. So uh, how do you say? Community kitchens, community kindergartens, uh, all types of agriculture, urban agriculture, uh, cooperatives and, and co-ops of any type of services. We're trying to create those things in order to create popular assemblies of that community and then create collective mandates to, to go for elections and try to, instead of one parliamentary, one person representing them, we try to gather a collective of five, seven people. I was part of one in, in one of those 2018. We almost got elected here in Brasilia, the capital. And it is, we have many collective mandates here elected in Brazil that we say is a way to hack the political system as well. And so we're trying to do those things in the cities. In the country, we, we have the, the Bem Viver agroecological communities that we have farmers and, and, and campesinos from land reform movements that fought for land for decades. And now they have their land, but they have a very tough time to produce. So we're producing through agroforest systems. And we connect with people in the cities that buy that production like as a, as a monthly quote, and then we produce and we regenerate a forest here, whether in the, in the savannah or in the, in the Amazon. So we're regenerating that forest while we are producing a lot. And so this production is already pre-bought by people in the cities. And we, we do this, we, we, we harvest every week and we share with everyone. We also have talks and also have a community sharing of things every, every week. It's a very, very nice way of creating solidarity. And we also have those mutirões, which is a, an event of collective work for the common good. And we, we built in the indigenous communities, in the Quilombola communities, in the fishing communities, and many, many other places in Brazil. We also build those events where we like build a community building for that community. And we do that in a week or in two weeks. And then everyone, we, we gather everyone to make an alliance to defend that land. And it's very, very nice to experience that when people build those things together, they are very, very willing to go there and defend when they're in trouble. So it's very nice that we see that right now when they go to, to evict a community and to destroy a community, it's not just a radical eco-socialist that go and lie in front of the bulldozer. It's a lot of people that one week before, one month before would say they would never do such a thing. But since they built that community, they, they, they had that experience, that life-changing experience, they are willing to do that. And we're trying to gather all those things. It's very tough to build a movement here, with criminalization, depoliticization, and so many, so many things of a very fragmented left here in Brazil. And next year, it's election year, so things are very tough here because people think that all of the communitary work is opportunistic in an electoral way. So it's not, not very easy at all. But we are, we are facing those things and we built a movement. And last, last October 12th, we've launched a movement here in Brazil. It was very, very nice. And of course, we have trouble like every movement has, and, but we're doing our best. And part of our mission here is to create, like Gabriela said, alliances and work together because we have a mission right now. We have a historical mission that has been left to us and all the history of revolution has left a, a banner to us and said, carry on everyone, <laughs> it's your turn now and we're doing our best. So 32 years after the Berlin Wall crashed, we are trying to make right now a system change with a lot of, a lot of pride and a lot of collective work, which is the only way that we will succeed. And I really think we will succeed, but it's really tough right now, but we're doing our best. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> it was nice of you. Thank you so much, Tiago. Really, really, I really appreciate all you shared. And well, I have a lot of reflections, but let's leave it for, for the q and I'm gonna call Kate here. Are you there, Kate? 
the floor is yours. Thank Welcome. you very much. Thanks, Gabriella, and thanks, Tiaza. That was amazing to hear. Um, and yeah, I'm really pleased and honoured to be here. Um, first things first, I am the least ill person in a house full of quite ill people. So I just feel like I need to say that, <laughs> like, in case I have a small coughing fit or a tiny child walks in. Um, but yeah, there's, we're in a bit of a plague house at the moment here. But um, all is going to be okay, hopefully. Uh, so, hi. I'm Kate Swade. I am um, one of the co-directors of Shared Assets, which is a think and do tank, which is essentially shorthand for saying we do lots and lots of different things, um, which is all about reimagining the land system in the UK. So we, um, we, we do lots of different types of quite practical projects that are really all about building new relationships or rekindling old relationships between people and the land. Um, I won't, I mean, Bonnie's, Bonnie has gone into and Tiago touched on, long, on lots of issues that I think are really um, reflected here in the UK as well about why land is such an important issue. I won't go into all of those because I'm assuming <clears throat> everyone's here because they kind of know that. But I suppose one of the key things we have found over the last nine years or so is that um because land is everywhere it is almost invisible it's kind of universality it's ubiquitousness makes it hard to see and talk about and engage with as like a strategic issue so our work spans from consultancy work with landowners and local authorities around creating new models for managing and governing land. So for example, we've done a lot of work around um, how do you manage parks? In an era of austerity, parks are not a statutory service. Local authorities want to manage them, their budgets have been cut, what do they do? So we do quite a lot of very practical thinking about business planning, working with communities and friends of groups and thinking about how you might restructure park services. We also do a lot of work with what we call common good land stewards or common good land users who are community organisations, co-ops, charities, social enterprises, anarchist collectives who are managing or engaging with or stewarding land in one way or another. So they might be... <coughs> um, uh running a farm or doing a horticultural veg box scheme they might be running a woodland they might be looking after their local park they might be a campaign group trying to get hold of some land or to stop something bad happening to land and often we work with those people on both business models but also governance issues so like how do you work as a group together how do you make decisions and they vary on the spectrum of um from very participatory to relatively um hierarchical and there's sort of there's a whole world of stuff in there and we also do a lot of research so we do research but ranging from yeah very participatory kind of um action research projects with people up to um partnerships with like academics so we're part of a couple of um horizon 2020 funding programs which are deeply unparticipatory and kind of very um very heavy and top down and a lot of that work focuses on food and farming and particularly how do we um grapple with the fact that in the uk you know the like it, the farming system <laughs> has a whole heap of problems which are being exacerbated by things like brexit and things i won't go into all of that but lots of like interconnected issues but the key thing I think that's relevant for this and what I want to dive into is the fact that no matter how good you are at running your veg box scheme or how amazingly participatory your woodland based social enterprise is or how you've done an amazing job of restructuring your parks department to provide really good quality public space on 20% of the money that you used to have all of those projects are operating within a system that is deeply unjust 
and deeply centralized and some would say designed to be so some might say it's kind of come about by accident but no matter you know how you think we got here we are here in a system where yeah 0.7 percent of the population owns 70 percent of the land and there's deep opaqueness about how decisions get made um and so we have always done at shared assets bits of what we now call movement building and i'll talk a little bit about some of that in a second but over the past year or so we have kind of consciously gone okay let's sort of create this other arm of the organization we have called it movement building we could have just easily called it field building or kind of ecosystem support or something i feel like movement building is almost like a step with we're not quite there yet i think in terms of we're not in some, we're not doing what Tiago is we're not actually out there galvanizing a movement but we we are starting i think to see a number of the yeah starting to try to join together threads and to build on things and to sort of i think in a way calling it a movement is half it's almost half the battle and kind of getting there so i wanted to give essentially um three key examples of things that we have done that fall under that broad movement building banner I'm very happy to answer questions about things and there's more to say about all of them. I've got some various things to share and I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to show you a film, but we might try 10 seconds of it and see if everyone can hear it before like making you watch I think it's only a couple of minutes long. Uh, so when we think about our movement building work, we, we so sort of there's two there's kind of it's a two pronged thing. Some stuff is shared assets as an actor. So that is us seeing something that we think needs to happen or to change and trying to go out there and get money and build a partnership to go into go and do something do a project some of that is us acting as infrastructure for other people where we very much don't want to be in control or get in the way but we recognize that we have some level of privilege as a small organization that doesn't have a huge amount of funding but does have a bit of core funding we do have a bank account we do have a payroll facility so for example, with a bank account for the Right to Roam campaign, with a bank account for Lion, which is a collective of people who you should all check out, Land in Our Names, a collective of people of colour who are really doing really creative work addressing land reform issues and the, the need for reparations in a UK context. So we try and kind of act as a bit of like almost neutral scaffolding for people who are out there doing good work so they don't need to think about it. Um, so the first example that I want to give is um, probably the most complex and the one that Bonnie will know the best. Um, so as it was mentioned in my little bio, we, um, we were part of the coalition that organised a conference called Land for What, which was back in November 2016. So that's a really long time ago now, um, which brought together, I think it was over 400 people over a weekend to try and want well, to talk about land and what it should be for. And part of the hypothesis of that event was that a Welsh hill farmer would have something to say to an anti-gentrification an anti -gentrification activist from Stratford or somewhere, because everyone has, because land is the thing that all of these people had in common. And as well as um, people from Radical Housing Network, Land Workers Alliance, um, there were some people from the London Quaker groups, uh, the New Economics Foundation. There, were, I think, there was about nine organisations in all, kind of organised this event, and then out of that um, grew a thing called the Land Justice Network, which felt like it could be the beginning of a movement. And people's land policy then kind of grew out of the Land Justice Network, um, but the Land Justice Network is now dormant, and. This is one of the reasons um, why I said I feel like almost we're, we're kind of a step, but we're still a step behind actually movement building at the moment. I think a lot of lessons were learned in that kind of land for what turning into the land justice network. Um, move, sort of, there was a lot of um, challenging, certain, challenging circumstances for people. There was lots of uh, interpersonal difficulty of various different kinds there was maybe not quite enough groundwork had been done to build a basis of trust between everybody who was working really hard 
Um, and actually, a lot of amazing stuff has come out of that network of people who are doing things. So the Right to Roam campaign, the People's Land Policy work. And so one of the things we've done over the past year is kind of slightly circle back into that and recognize that one of the key things that Land Justice Network had was actually a very strong web presence and really good uh, SEO. So we've, um, so I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, here we go. Share my screen. Last time I did this, I accidentally shared, um, I'd been internet shopping for dressing gowns and accidentally shared all the dressing gowns <laughs> with everybody. But um, so at the moment, if you go to Land Justice UK, um, it says that it's dormant, but what we've done is a piece of quite light, and I'm going to be revisiting this soon, ecosystem mapping. So like I said, I'm not sure that we're at the phase where we've got a movement, but there is definitely an ecosystem of people. So hoping that this starts to act as a bit of a directory for people who are interested in um, uh, land justice issues, but that aren't expecting, well, recognising that there isn't currently a network that sits in the middle of all of this that can really um, direct people to things. So hope, hoping that people can um, self-organise themselves a bit. So here is a slightly um, complicated looking, but actually very easy to uh, navigate map and you can play with it. Um, but so you can go, oh, I wonder who is doing projects around travellers' rights. And then you can find all of the people who are doing projects around travellers' rights. And then say you can, these guys are fab, LGBT Traveller Pride, you can click on them and you can find out how to get more information, if they're looking for people, what kind of skills they might be needing. So it's quite a light touch thing. Um, but hopefully the beginning of this Land Justice UK website being repurposed as a bit more of a signposting directory kind of um, a place just to show the, the vibrancy and the, diverse, the, diver, the diversity of things that are going on and already happening out there and not um, what it was before, which was a little bit of a blocker that people were kind of arriving at Land Justice Network and hoping it would do something for them. And for various reasons, it wasn't really doing anything. So we've been trying to work with that. The other thing, um, it's actually very new news. So you're like hot off the press here. We're going to be um, working with um, a couple of people who were involved before to revive this thing called the land letter. So if you do Land Justice UK and join the um, mailing list uh, in the next couple of months, you should, let me just stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, we're, we've got, we found a little pot of money, which is probably enough to pay for three or four issues of this land letter, which is aiming to bring in um, uh, all of the news and kind of amplify the things that are happening across the ecosystem. So both things like this, but also uh, books and talks and events um, and all sorts of things. And so hoping that that's again going to start to just do some of that gentle signposting and pointing to things. Um, so watch that space. Something that we did, so that's sort of again us kind of thinking of ourselves as a bit like infrastructure. In terms of us being a bit of an actor, um, something we've always known, like I said at the beginning, is that land is actually really hard to talk about. Um, often you end up in sort of weird emotional arguments with people that you don't quite understand. And so we commissioned some work mid pandemic, so probably middle of last year, with um, uh, uh, from with some people with the Future Narratives Lab and did some exploration around the um, uh, yeah like the current land narrative like the current way that land is talked about and again let me share my screen here um, so there is this website here Future Narratives Lab with Land We Can and so we've done a couple of things here I'm just going to scroll here, but there we've got this sense of the current narrative we kind of started to break down how what it, it how are the ways in which people talk about land and this key thing of 
seeing that in the, the dominant way that land is talked about in the media and in sort of popular narrative is that it is something that is inherently vulnerable. And that is actually not vulnerable. It's the way, it's the system that makes it vulnerable to things. And we started to explore, and I, I won't go into it now because there's quite a lot there, but we started to explore like what are the frames that underpin this and this sense of land as being this scarce thing. And also this idea that change is something that cannot happen. And you see this happening a lot in the way that um, the land for the many report was received or even Scottish land reform being talked about either as um, kind of utopian dreamers, you know, all these stupid hippies, it's never going to happen. Or it's like mob rule and people are going to come and they're going to take your garden off you. And um, these kind of uh, sort of unpicking how these frames work. And then we did this amazing project with um, uh, Future Narratives Lab and Lion um, called Emerging Land Voices. And I was going to show you this film, but I think I've been talking for a bit too long. But I think you should all go and watch this film because it's really good, which starts to it starts to bring out the bones of a new way of thinking about land and sort of talking about land and we have a similar diagram further down here which kind of ex sort of starts to think about land as the place where yeah where we get better together where it is a place of possibility a, a horizon that we can innovate and create new systems within and that we all are constantly making more of what we have and that actually how we break out of that dominant way of thinking and talking about land um feels like a huge thing that like, i don't think we're going to get movement change and system change without that kind of cultural shift in the way that we think and talk about land and then just the final thing i wanted to share is again we haven't done we haven't like promoted this very much yet but um We've been involved with a project called Land for Who. Oh, that doesn't look right, does it? Um, which um, is here we go. Uh, involved and Bonnie again was part was part interviewed as part of this. Um, was all thinking about like what is it that people at the grassroots and on on the front lines actually want for policy change in the land system? One of one of the questions being, do we need an English land commission? Because we've had a Scottish land commission. And there's going to be some blogs and things to accompany this, but this, this interactive graphic is something we commissioned, which is essentially a worm's eye view of the land system. Like we, we see a lot of kind of landscape scale views of what the land system looks like. But that actually what we're, what we're seeing is that in the UK at the moment, there's a huge amount of energy and activity and connection in the grassroots and in the soil. But there's this kind of heavy concrete of the existing systems and narratives that sort of sit on top and squash that and partly i think the first steps for movement building are really about kind of aerating and fertilizing that soil and it trying to create the kind of the mycelial networks to connect people to each other and then I think the movement will erupt and burst through. I'm not sure that we can create that, but we can work on the, on the soil structure. So that's what we're trying to do at Shared Assets. And um, I think that's probably enough from me. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Kate. Really, really inspiring. I think everyone in the chat uh, mentioned that the mapping, the mapping suggestion, the mapping tools you 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 shared, like they're very very useful, and I'm very glad with everything that you just shared. A lot of learning, and yeah. So now we're welcoming Karima so that she can speak a little bit more about movement building from the perspective of the London Mining Network. Welcome, Karima. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Bonnie, for inviting um, me from the London Mining Network. And thank you, Tiago and Kate, um, for such amazing talks. So I just don't know how I'm going to follow that. Um, just before I share my screen, I just, while um, we were starting, I was just keeping an eye on people and what they were putting in the chat. And I noticed a couple of things. There seem to be a lot of people who are really interested in food growing and also people interested in participatory democracy. And I just wanted to say that mining 
is the thing, one of the things that it really threatens is food security. Um, and that for communities who may be resilient, for example, during the lockdowns, because they had access to forests and they could grow and gather food and didn't need money or shops, that access to land made them more resilient. And that is the thing that mining companies, when they open mining projects, they take away. Um, they take it away by displacing people and they take it away by contaminating the soil and the water, the ability to provide your, for yourself and be resilient as a community. Um, and the other thing is that many of those communities that we work with are actually have within their culture participatory democracy um, already. So, for example, communities in India who um, have, uh, under the constitution, these are rights that they have fought for rights to have a say over what happens to their forests they um you know they uh, and it, this is right down at village level so the village councils meet and they decide whether a mining project or a big dam or something like that should go ahead and of course that right to decide in that way is resisted with by both sort of um, dishonest means and also violence by the companies and the state and so on but um, and also along with that is the um, recently some, a, a large, large group of um, vill, uh, forest dwellers in India protesting against a coal mine went on a 300 kilometer march to uh, talk to their elected, uh, elected res, uh, representatives to up, demand justice. And one of the things they talked about as well is their vision for how their villages could be instead of coal mining they said we, what they wanted was a network of self-governing, self-sufficient villages with lots of access to forest and land for growing food. Anyway, uh, just, um, just, it was just that those thoughts struck me because I saw that all the questions and I just, I, you know, I just wanted to respond straight away like that. But what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to share my screen and I'm going to talk about um, movement building. So uh, like Kate, I'm a little anxious about whether this is going to go right. Um, okay, can you all see that? Will someone yeah. shout yes? Oh great, okay. Um, right, okay. So my name is Karima and I'm the education coordinator at London Mining Network. So I do the outreach into schools and universities. Um, and uh, today, I'm going to talk about a movement building. Um, and uh, the slogan that always comes to my mind is this very old one that goes, educate, agitate, organize. And I've always thought that the educate is like three people. Educate is the sort of intellectual one with lots of knowledge and is very interesting. Agitate is maybe the exciting person, a little bit dangerous. And then organize is kind of a bit houseworky. It seems like the boring thing and I feel like what I'm going to talk about today is essentially about doing the housework so um, but it is the thing the invisible thing that we should always value now I found a, a, a quote that probably lots of people here know um, from Martin Luther King the arc of the moral universe is long but it bends towards justice and I was when I was just researching some various publications to see what I could find out about movement building and whether we were doing it right. Um, I found this particular one called Making Change What Works. I'll put the link in the chat later. Um, and there was a quote about this Martin Luther King quote which says, but we must remember that the arc is only bent by the relentless organized efforts of inspiring social movements. So it is not something that just happens it is something that we make happen and it, it takes a lot of work so who are london mining network what does calling mining companies to account mean how does it all work why does it work are we successful and what do we mean by success so these are the sort of areas that i'm going to cover um, so who are london mining network we work with communities all around the world who are harmed by or at risk of harm by the activities of london listed mining companies 
um, that is on the London Stock Exchange and also its subsidiary, the um, alternative investment market. We also work on occasions with mine workers and their unions. And because we're here in London, we can call these companies to account over their activities. Um, I'm not going to show you this short video, I'm sorry, because I tried to do it earlier and I realized that it was a bit complicated to, to actually get it started. So sorry about that, but if you go to our website, you might be able to watch it. Um, I'll put the link later. So what I wanted to talk about next is what does calling mining companies to account mean? So working with communities and also mine workers to stop or mitigate the damage that the mining, the mining company is causing or could potentially cause. We assist communities and other people harmed by mining with seeking compensation to expose mining company lies, the broad lies such as greenwashing and claims about corporate social responsibility, but also sometimes the smaller lies about what they're actually doing at a particular mine waste um, site, a tailings dam, um, or what they are not, what they say they're doing, or what they don't say they're doing. Um, we work, we um, lobby regional, national and international organisations to improve regulation and oversight of mining. We raise public awareness of the problems associated with mining. We promote awareness of post-extractivist futures and just transition. So people always say, what are the alternatives to mining? You know, will we always need mining? And we've realised that we need to think about that and that's something also that we work on. And perhaps most importantly, our work is about building solidarity between people and becoming parts of networks, part of networks of resistance and mutual support. There's probably things I've missed, but I know that there's one or two other people from LMN here in the audience, so they'll probably fill in the details later, but I've left out. So how does it all work? So building and maintaining networks are at the heart of our work. And I noticed when I was going through this document, the Making Change What Works, which was actually published by um, the Runnymede Trust and another partner, and they'd done a sort of audit working with Black Lives Matter and LGBT um, and various other broader movements than we are. But they looked at, um, they, they drew some insights from that. And when I mapped some of what we do against their insights, I realized that we were doing similar things. And what they call a well-developed ecosystem of influence, they say movements need a well-developed ecosystem of influence, I thought that is actually very similar to our network. So firstly, they say the ecosystem has a broad range of different groups and activities. This allows movements to simultaneously push for change from different perspectives using different methods. And LMN's formal network consists of over 20 groups and individuals, all based in the UK and one or two elsewhere as well including large NGOs, small solidarity groups, and some individuals. And between us in that network, we have a wide range of ideologies and philosophies and beliefs. There are Catholics and Catholic organizations, people with lib a liberal view, there are environmentalists, we have Marxists of various different stripes, including Leninists, anarchists, people with eco-spiritual perspectives, just a wide range of people. But what we have in common and what brings us together and the thing, the purpose, the common shared purpose that we work on is a shared concern and a desire to work together to support the people harmed by the activities of mining companies or their funders and insurers listed in London, where we are based, mostly. We are also, we have a bigger network than our formal network, so we are just part of a number of informal networks who we work with on different issues um, and these are not actual actually formally structured in that we don't meet with them four times a year and they don't approve um, projects and so on um, but these are based on trust and again on shared purpose and not all of these activities are these networks are continually active or even active at the same time and they are also very diverse. They include mine affected communities, including indigenous communities, uh, country based NGOs around the world and individuals, including lawyers and also 
um, academics who have expertise in different areas that um, are important to our work, including people with technical knowledge, uh, church-based works, trade unions and other civil society organisations representing large groups of people affected by particular issues that relate to mining, for example, um, Mabi in Brazil. Um, bringing together people from around the world for company AGMs is one of the um, important activities that we were doing until things got slowed down by the, the lockdown. So what we would do is when, for example, Rio Tinto, which is one of the biggest mining companies in the world, had its AGM in London, we would invite people from different communities who are affected by Rio Tinto to come to London to challenge the company, to attend the AGM if they wished, to uh, maybe tour um, around uh, the UK to meet other meet people, for example, from mining communities here, um, and to meet each other. And um, this has been a really important thing in building solidarity because it meant that people made connections. Sometimes people didn't realize that they were affected in similar ways by the same company in completely different parts of the world. And what we have out of this is, just to use Rio Tinto as an example, is quite an active Rio Tinto group with members in or connected to communities in Mongolia, United States, Madagascar, Bougainville, Serbia and elsewhere, who work together on Rio Tinto. Um, other people come together to work together thematically, for example, on mine waste, on the idea of just transition, or we have regional networks as well. So we have the, our work has developed, has been really developed in over the years in Latin America, for example. So our Latin American workers and our networks have grown so much that we're actually going to have to start finding someone, some more people to manage them. So as you can imagine, there is a lot going on. So why does it all work? Um, there's focus, I think come back to that thing about what do we all have in common? It's this shared concern and desire to work together to support the people harmed by the activities of mining companies. It is the communities that we work with that lead our work and we always consult with them. Um, and um, we also have connection. We, I've listed something here, but I just to say in a different way, we do make it, a really important thing to always keep in touch with people, to always respond to emails and you know, correspondence and, and, and to keep that live so, and to find out how people are and, and so on. So connection is really important. Um, but, and we also connect to external events and campaigns. So uh, for example, to demonstrating relevance, for example, the Black Lives Matter um, movement, climate justice, the arms trade, for each of these things, we have tried to find a way of showing how our work connects with those. Um, particularly around the arms trade, we asked a researcher um, to produce a report that connect, connects um, mining companies and their the relationship with the military. Um, we've been, as a, when I do my education work, I've worked with young people who are um, concerned about climate justice and uh, like the Fridays for Future and the student climate change and I've done workshops with them um, about mining and its relationship to those things. Um, we make it really clear that in relation to Black Lives Matter, mining is rooted in colonialism on the taking over of other people's land and it is particularly pernicious in the global south and um, we've again done some education work and we work with communities who um, you could say that the, their resistance to mining is part of the Black Lives Matter struggle in a, a very specific way. And the other thing that the document that I mentioned before, this uh, making change what works, it, it mentions that this ecosystem um, or what we call a network um, or networks um, need depth and capability. So they need to have sufficient resources and the ability to take the under to undertake the activities they set out to do effectively, including having funding, um, 
people with the skills and knowledge, talent, commitment, um, all of those things are needed. And actually, one of the things we often think about is if something needs doing, we think about who can do it. And if they can't do it, how can we enable it to be done, perhaps by raising money or, um, and recruiting someone? So are we successful? What do we mean by success? So ultimate success for us and the many people we work with would be a just transition in which no one is thrown out of work, for example, mine workers working in dirty coal mining or uranium or something, and into poverty. So we would like a just transition to a post-extractivist society in which mining would be kept to an absolute minimum based only on need, if there is no alternative source of the material, only done with the permission of the people who live on the land or nearby, and carried out to the highest environmental and labor standards. Obviously, we haven't achieved this yet, but there is a growing conversation about what a just transition, what a post-extractivist society would look like, which we are part of. And we have produced a couple of really important reports around this um, over the past couple of years. Um, so what does success look like? Well, whenever we talk about this in meetings, we always find it really difficult to talk about because we're really conscious that we are always in partnership with others and that we can never take sole credit for what we achieve. However, London Mining Network has become a point of contact for people all over the world and has helped them to meet each other. We have grown our core staffing, which sort of serves, services the networks and maintains an overview of what's happening and reports to trustees and funders and so on, has had to grow in response to the growing networks. We have exposed activities by companies. Um, our reports, our protests, our press work does damage the reputation of mining companies and they are aware of us. And Perhaps most importantly, people from communities resisting mining, often facing huge danger, tell us that we help to keep them going. I'd just like to finish with a couple of quotes. So a few years ago, this is well, our coordinator who's actually here in the audience has a favorite story that he likes to tell us. Um, when a few years ago, he was in the office and the phone went, and on the other end was Jonas Vanna, a Sami reindeer herder campaigning against Beowulf mining, um, where the, an iron ore deposit is, um, Beowulf mining would like to, to uh, extract iron ore from this at Kalak, north of the Arctic Circle in Sweden. Anyway, he rang the LMN office one day simply to tell our coordinator, Richard, I am so glad we have friends in London. And um, at our annual gathering, um, when we invite people, um, which we invite people who we work with to, um, um, Maria Olympic, who um, is from Serbia and has been uh, with resisting a large gold and copper mine there, said the following, it means the world to us that we are not alone. At the very beginning, when we started this struggle, we were considered crazy and against development. So it helps to meet people who are fighting for justice in all the possible levels. Thanks a lot to London Mining Network for all the help and all the support we got from you. It has moved our game up a lot of levels. I have learned a lot from you. So I'd just like to finish by saying that um, I'm not really here to, <laughs> to blow our trumpet. Um, we have a long way to go and are many things we can improve, but this is just a little bit of an insight into the work of London Mining Network. Um, I'm going to stop there and um, I think hand back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karima. Really, I really appreciate all you all you just share about uh, London Mining Network. It's it's a great experience and it's it's based in the UK, so I think there is a lot of good experiences to be shared with all others here present. And well, I just sent a message in the chat asking for everyone that has 
questions or comments to share with the with the speakers also feel free to raise your hand and we can call you so you can make the question yourself right now i have a couple of questions to the speakers and i'm gonna share here uh with you um so from from tiago and karima uh there was a question i would like to hear from from karima and tiago about how they got to the point where they at they are right now so in case you want to just share a little bit about your path and how you how you end up where you are right now that would be nice and also another question that i think is a more general one that i would love to hear from everyone here it's uh what do you think that are the paths to create a social majority as tiago mentioned in, when he was speaking what do you think that it's reasonable or feasible i would love to hear your thoughts on that and lastly which can go to kate but everyone is welcome as well to jump in is how do you think we can ensure that the movement is not dominated by only by professionals which means that those that are paid or have the time to be active on the movement how do we ensure we have an actual uh wide participation on everyone so yes feel free everyone to keep sharing your questions here or raise your hand and i will i will be glad to assist and now i'm going to open the floor for tiago if you're up for sharing <laughs> thank you gabriella and thank you karima and, and kate and everyone it's a great presentation i really appreciate it, hearing it so the, the I believe the first two questions are, are the ones I should answer to. And the first one and how how I got where I'm at and how everyone else in the movement got where we we're at. But I'll start with, with me. I I have 35 years and 16 years ago I decided that I wanted a different life here and and I started to to go to the to the camps where the campesinos were fighting for land reform and the indigenous territories. And I would try to learn from that experience. And I was trying to understand the, the point we did and I was trying to understand the, the idea of a revolution. I was a socialist back then. And then a few years later, I realized I was an eco-socialist and therefore a Marxist as well, <laughs> as, as remembered by Karim, which are part of the, the network of movements. And many, many years, uh, we, we were trying to create an or, a revolutionary organization, but we were always facing the same problems, which is based on a, a really real crisis of praxis here in Brazil, because we have such a fragmented left environment here. And so most of the organization are more based on institutional change and in running for elections in the political parties and some of them are only focused on a single issue and a single struggle not based on the totality that a system change might need and i was also part of that so people uh, my i myself and a lot of people they were in different collectives and never had an, an organization organization that would gather everything in a revolutionary program and Therefore, we would be a great ally to the indigenous community nearby and the other one that we knew. And, and we were also in the occupations in the, the slums in Brazil, but they, they were not talking to themselves and they were not part of the same strategy together. So it was very, very tough. And I, I also realized that we have uh, real trouble to to make propaganda and to agitate. And so we went for the social network with a lot of energy and, and I have a YouTube channel and, and also a lot of people from, from our movement and from our, our line of, of our political line. We, we have a lot of social network work as well. And, and it's, it's been working. So we're, we're, we're trying to, to balance the social network interaction with a lot of grassroots construction and trying to make a bridge so that everyone that gets captivated by the social network they 
have an, a call to action to go immediately to the grassroots movement and the, to, to the, the real and concrete action in the cities, in the country, or in the, the biomes. So I, I was part of this. Um, I was always trying to create the bridges and, and to, to create trust in organizations. And it was not, not very easy at all, actually. I, I built a lot of political organizations and collectives, and we were all experiencing a lot of things and trying to create a better formula to do that. And we, we also share some of the, those problems, like sometimes in election years, we'll go so so heavily to the institutional solutions when we even with a radical discourse but still uh, even involuntarily saying that the change had to go through the voting stations and through the institutional powers here which are controlled by the bourgeoisie and so, and so therefore completely incapable of making structural change and a few a few years ago we decided to go to go a different path and to that our social majority would need more a mass movement than a stronger political party. So we were trying to create and we're creating this movement, but it's not a mass movement yet. But we, uh, we have a dialogue with the political party that we, we, we are close to, which is PSOL, which is the one party that has an open path to eco-socialism and we were of the people who created PSOL many many years ago and but we don't the, the movement is not subject to the party to the political party see the very opposite so the movement has complete autonomy and has a democratic alliance for elections and we go for the political party but we don't we don't think the the, the situation of depoliticization here in Brazil and the reject into political parties and something that does not help to create a, a social majority at the, the, the suburbs and at the poorest communities. Therefore, we, we, we are doing our best here, so it's not, not very easy. And, and I'm already going to the second question, which is the path to create the social majority. We believe that many political movements had a successful story about it. We, we can talk about, for example, the Black Panther Black Panthers Party in the U.S., where they every day to 2,400 kids had breakfast with the Black Party's lunch, uh, the, the breakfast communities, and while they were having breakfast, their their mothers and their fathers were talking to to the party militants and talking about the different society that they wanted to build. We can also we also have the same thing about the Social Democratic Party when Rosa Luxemburg was alive in, in Germany because. They had schools, they had, they had weekend clubs, and they had so many, so many things, and had, had kindergarten, so many initiatives. And here in Brazil, in the 80s, we also had that with the theology of liberation communities based on the, the poorest communities as well. And all those, those things of communitary, self-organized work uh, really works a lot to, to create the social majority because we can say anything we want, we can say the most radical things we want, but if we don't have a praxis of that, if we don't have a concrete solution for the concrete problem that the person has, we cannot really captivate her and we cannot engage her in any political activity because they won't really believe in it. So we try to make as best as we can that our work speaks for us. And it's not very easy, it's not, a really a short-term initiatives like a long construction but why we're doing the strategic long-term <laughs> investment but we, we are also trying to use every window we have with, with the everyday problems the genocide as well to make propaganda and to fight and resist as, as bad as, as best as we can but we believe that our revolution is like one decade, two decades away. <laughs> and we are doing our best to, to create the conditions for that. But meanwhile, we'll do our best resisting and trying to gather energy. That's pretty much what we are doing, but we have a sense of urgency because of the environmental disaster, because of exploitation, because of all oppressions. So therefore, we, we, we have a strategy to do that, to build a mass movement for that has a totality program that works in the cities, in the country, and in the biomes, 
but we'll do our best meanwhile to avoid catastrophe and, and, and fight at the struggles of our time. But, but, and we think that resisting and also constructing is part of the, our two, two decades program to create a revolution. That's pretty much what we're, we're working with. Thanks, Tiago. I don't know if anyone has a reaction and would like to add, or if Kate would just like to follow. Feel free to take the, the floor as well. Um, okay, um, so your question to me was about um, paid people and not paid people in the movement, right? Um, which I think is a really, it's, it's a really, it's, it's an issue, right? That, that there's, um, uh, I don't think it's something that every organization or campaign or movement needs to grapple with. Um, and I don't know that I have a great answer for it, to be honest. I think, I think um, the fact that we are, um, okay, thank you for putting that in here. Because, um, yeah, I think there's also a difference between the people being paid and people who have the time to be very active. Like, and there's a, there's a privilege inherent in both of those things. Um, I, I just wonder whether we're at the stage where there isn't one movement here. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of movements. And um, there's something about helping people find the pathways to the bit of the movement that really resonates with them. And brings them joy and that might be volunteering at their local community garden or getting involved with an allotment or that might be campaigning and direct action and yeah being out there on the front lines or that might be something else entirely and I'm sure most of us who are paid in this kind of world are also doing stuff that isn't paid in our spare time as well and sort of everyone has various different hats that they wear at various different times. Um, you know, one of the things we do try to do as an organization that is in a position to pay people is like I was saying earlier, try and take some of that infrastructural, more like, um, dare I say, boring work off people and kind of be able to provide some of the, um, whether that's a bank account or, um, sort of bits of admin support and things that are things that don't, you know, people don't necessarily want to be doing in their spare time. Um, but I think, and um, I think this sort of links into your other conversation about like the social movement thing. Um, we, we, I, I think we're quite a long way from the cultural shift that we need in the UK for a proper social movement around land and the land system. And therefore, I think in order to do the work of getting there, the work has to be something that brings you joy and gives you pleasure and connects you with people who you enjoy spending time with. And, you know, I would do this work even if I wasn't paid, if I had another way of surviving. Like, I think there's something about trying to find the bit of the movement or the bit of the system that um, you really care for or you really, that really enlivens you and not necessarily the bit that you feel like you should be working in. Because yeah, there's a slog here, whether you're paid or you're not paid. And, um, you know, I heard someone start, a, I heard someone start to talk about land in the UK once with, you know, well, the rot set in in 1066 with William the Conqueror. And, you know, we've been, we're trying to change some stuff that's been in place for a really long time. And that doesn't mean that change can't happen quite quickly. But um, yeah, I'm I'm babbling now. But like, yes, I think I think it's it's an important power dynamic. It's an important issue that everyone needs to be aware of. I don't think there's an easy answer to it, other than. But part of that, I think, does need to be people who are being paid, being very respectful of the time of people who aren't being paid, and trying to do some of the work that is maybe less fun. So, yeah. I wonder if I could jump in there as well, um, because this is a discussion that we have a lot as well at LMN. Um, and um, when we started, we were, so we, there's been, some of us have been involved in, in campaigning and working with communities who are resisting mining for a lot longer than LMN has been around, because before that there was an organization called Mine Watch, 
and before that there was an organization called Partisans, which was People Against Rio Tinto. Um, and um, those were collectives, the first two organizations. And um, yes, there were some very fraught moments and tensions over who got money and who didn't, and all sorts of uh, you know, issues around were we more like a union than, or should, could we be more radical? It, lots and lots of discussions. Um, and I think that when, when LMN started, specifically with this aim of working on London listed companies, we started really small and the network was small. And, but we recognized that in order to ensure stability and to ensure that uh, the network that was maintained and could, could grow, we needed to pay someone to be there doing that work. So we appointed a coordinator. And then we, and it, their role is defined. And then we um, built on that because we needed a social, uh, sorry, a, a, a media and comms person. So that's the second person that we decided we needed to pay. Um, and then we acquired a programs um, and finance uh, coordinator because you know the work was developing and growing and we needed someone to help us keep an oversight on things so it didn't run away with us and we could structure it and then um there was a sort of demand for people to come in you know that some education work because we thought that we were not actually doing enough of one of our principles is to raise awareness and that's how i came in and we all none of us work full time and the, the roles are defined and it's in order to ensure that they happen that we're paid and we know that and we also don't want to be small and cliquey. So we spent some time working on structures to draw other people in. So when people come to volunteer with us, we look at, you know, we, we set sort of time limits and amounts of time and, um, and particular tasks that are easy to keep track of and don't force, don't mean that they're endlessly exploited. Now we do also have, very experienced people who uh, also have always and will continue to work for nothing or very little um, on research work and so on and they do it by choice but again you know we have to be careful we're not exploiting people so we that's why it's quite important to have regular meetings to discuss the work and to to keep an oversight of what's happening um, and in addition to that we also we have make sort of we occasionally pay people a consultancy uh, to to do research that's specifically needed perhaps for a particular issue or something like that so we try to define very clearly what is paid and we try to enable other people to get involved and people who volunteer have the option of staying on in some way as part of the network if they're based in the right place or you know just generally if they're working on the issues themselves in future then we stay in touch they become part of one of the wider networks or they become part of a working group um so we try to grow at the same time as maintaining control over what happens it's not easy and it's often accompanied by a lot of guilt of i'm paid but someone else isn't and you know all that sort of stuff <laughs> that was one of the things i wanted to answer and the other thing is, um, I just, um, we, we have a sort of principle about being kind. Um, and that comes out of years of experience of sort of fractious situations and so on. And I think that a good example is what just happened just now in the chat. So um, I made a little mistake in my talk, um, which I'm going to correct in a minute, but someone else who's here uh, quickly wrote to me, really good talk, nice thing said just a small thing I want to pick you up on, corrected my mistake. And then I said, whoops, sorry. And then they came back with, no, it was a great talk. It was, so it's this thing, this skill of knowing how to speak to people. And it's a very important, and we don't, we don't put enough value. It's what I call emotional housework, if you like. I, like, I really come back to this term housework. You know, we don't pay people to do housework. We should pay people to do housework because they sustain everyone else. And the same thing in organizations, the people who do the housework are the people who should be paid. Um, because not everything is joyful and fun to do, but sometimes it's absolutely necessary. Um, anyway, I just should correct my mistake now and say that the mine in Serbia, there was actually a lithium mine, not a copper and gold mine. So, anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I, I'm not sure if Bonnie has uh, anything specific to share or if, if anyone else would like to pose uh, some specific questions or closing remarks from the speakers. Uh, Bonnie, any, any suggestions? Um, are there any other questions that have come up from any of the audience or you haven't seen anything yet? No? No, not. not I mean, yet. I suppose what I wanted to ask all the speakers is that, and I think Tiago touched on this, I think, with the idea of the community, that if people are going to be part of a movement, they have to be in the same space somehow because uh, what i found is for example we've done all these seminars and we've got all these different people that have passed through the seminars and they're all interested and they all want to be involved in doing something but effectively these people cannot form a movement until somehow we're all involved together in something and i think the same thing happened with the land for what conference it was very good, all these people together in one room, but we haven't then gone on to make some kind of, because people talked about connections, the connections that keep people together so that you're actually then working towards something together. So I guess I was interested in the London Mining Network. Somehow you must have gone from a bunch of individuals and various contacts to a a network that you're you've got solidarity you've got all these connections between you and the same with Thiago. so how could we go in this country from a situation where we've got loads of people doing all these different things that they're not actually connected into anything and uh we're stopping us i think doing that so i was just wondering what people had to say about that, or anyone in the audience really, what ideas people had for how could we go from all, as someone has said, we've got all these people doing all these brilliant things all over Britain, but they're not connected. Sorry, can I have another go? <laughs> Is that all right? Um, I, I was given some advice a long time ago um, when I, it was way back in the 90s and i was involved in this group called mind watch and we were I, I i i was involved in actually setting up and organizing a kind of women and mining network and a women and mining conference and we were working with a group in the philippines and it was one of those women from the philippines that said that it's a, a really good way to start and they had a very we were going to have the conference there because they were a really successful group that encompassed all sorts of issues indigenous people mining mine workers often the same people mine workers and indigenous communities um and they'd organized you know and they had women's organizations and they had really strong organizations and they were really good role model for other people who were going to travel there and um one of those women said it's really good to start small with your friends and the people you trust um, or you know they might be people with who are working on shared issues who you trust and get along with and can develop a friendship or a relationship with but that was her advice to start small because sometimes when there's large groups of people i and and there's and somehow a movement doesn't emerge until you've managed to have those maybe small conversations where one or two or three people can talk to each other and then another one or two or three people can you know and you build it from there can i can i go <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you guys uh, well, i i'm really liking this debate and i think that just a second yeah. I was trying to lower my hand, yeah. <laughs> and the, what we we were doing here together, a lot of energy and a lot of diversity from people who wanted to change the world, is that we're trying to create a synthesis, and we don't believe that a revolution will be the work of a single party, political party, or a single movement. So we have to work with this diversity. 
nonetheless, if we don't create synthesis and we, if only we say people are different, we won't advance in a, in a collective will and collective capacity to, to do bolder things, bolder actions. So what we, we do here is that we create program seminars to advance on our proposals and our solutions for, for the issues that we have, for, for exploitation, for oppressions, for ecological destruction. We also have strategy seminars to discuss this because the last century we had basically two revolutionary strategies, which was the insurrectional strike we had in the Soviet Union and the, the, the popular war we had in China for the Chinese revolution. So, and we tried an, an institutional way in Chile in the 70s and it didn't work, it was interrupted by the military coup. But right now we're trying to, to develop the, the revolutionary theory and the revolutionary methods for the 21st century. It's very, very tough. So we, we build seminaries to discuss this. And here in Brazil, we all have a consensus, people that build together. We need a social majority that we don't have right now. And so we have to create this, this objective condition to do such thing. Uh, but this doesn't stop us from creating a radical program and try to massify it. And because we, there, there's something here that I believe that could be something that dialogues as well with the situation there, Bonnie, that you're living in the moment. Because here we have, due to such a tragic government, a far right wing government, we have a tendency of a lot of people believing that, that we, we would need a moderate government that can, can gather together the, the liberals and the, the moderate left. But the, the analysis, the situation analysis that we do is that we are living a structural crisis of the capitalist system. And the, the, the metabolic erosion that we're living here in the social tissue and the, the production because of people exploitation and the destruction of nature, they are irreversible. So if we don't have a radical solution, if we don't talk about the property of the land, for instance, for example, we'll never be able to regenerate and end the ecological destruction. If we don't talk about the property of, of land in the cities, we'll never be able to build the collective houses. And if, if we don't talk in a way that is anti-system, the only people that will be doing that will be the fascists and the far right, because they're not really anti-system. They're, they're, Fascism is, a, is an arm of capitalism, uh, a method they have for, for troubled times and that has, wor has been working really well for a century, for at least a century in, the, in capitalism. But they say they're anti-system. So we see that with Trump, we see that with Bolsonaro. And until we have a movement and a lot of organizations and movements saying that we need to change the system radically and we have to, to be radical about the land, the collective property of land, for example, and to, to how do you say, uh, you nationalize the, the, the companies that the, the companies based on housing market and all those things and to, to create those things based on common good and making, making politi politics for land reform that are radical, we won't be able to connect with people because the, the far right radicals, and they are radical indeed, they, they say they are anti-system. And if we don't have an alternative to that, we are giving them a present to dialogue with all the frustrated people in this society that is collapsing. So therefore, what I believe that here we're trying to do this by creating seminaries for situation analysis, for program development and a political program and for dialoguing about strategy. But None of that would work if you don't have a radical discourse and if you don't go to the bottom of things. Radical is not like people, people that are angry and everything. And, and radical, people that go to the root of the things. <laughs> the root is that this, the system is collapsing. It's not working for people of nature. So we have to change the system. And that's how we've been dealing with it so far. Um, can I jump in quickly? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everything everyone's saying, really. I think on, on the 
the question of like yeah how do you bring people together um sorry my light's gone um the i think one and i'm just really resonating with maddie's comment in the chat but I think my experience of as particularly land for what that big event was where as soon as you when you bring people together with a with an objective like let's do a thing that everything then gets focused on the thing and I think something I'm seeing at the moment is there's lots of stuff happening loads of things out there people are acting people are working together in all sorts of different ways and one of the things we're trying to do with sort of the, the mapping work and like reviving the land letter is, is this sense of helping the system to know itself a bit better, like helping people to see that they're, when they are doing stuff, there are also other people in the same system doing things and to help put them in touch with each other if, they, if that's what they want to do. But my sense of actually trying to get everybody to then come and act collectively is that there are still quite a lot of um, differences of opinion about tactics, about the about how, exactly how radical, like how deep to go, and I think that can take a, those conversations can take a huge amount of energy and time, and and distracts away from the actions that people are taking anyway. I also think there's like very varying different tolerances for meetings and things. Um, and so I suppose what we're, what I'm wondering is whether, yeah, by trying to get more information out there, trying to connect people to each other better, and something we've been trying to do is create spaces for reflection, and actually almost consciously not action, like bringing people together to talk about stuff, but without any expectation that there'll be some planning to do something together at the end of it that we try and build a, a deeper levels of trust between people and we and sort of yeah, deepen that soil, make that soil more fertile so that when the time is ready for change to happen, things to, to happen, that, that, that might all happen quickly. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And I think just David's point about colonialism is really important here. Um, the i don't know if people have been following like the, the sort of what's been happening with the national trust as they've started to kind of expose the colonial roots of so much of what is perceived of as like classic british countryside and architecture and things that they that all of the things this whole country is built on the backs of and the on the on an extractive model of extracting the resources from much of the rest of the world and bringing that here. And I think actually both that exposure is a way into thinking about land for people that is often quite creative and of interest in. And it's definitely something we're really actively thinking about, about like what does a, a reparative sort of land system look like and and the, and that kind of concept of reparations of thinking both about the racial and the kind of international justice angle and also the fact that um you know so much of the disparity in wealth levels across the uk is because of that ca that kind of extractive capitalist model that like sort of started at home right and so so much of the kind of poor environmental quality in some of the ex-industrial places in in the uk none of the wealth they created stayed there it's like a kind of fractal colonial model and i think we need a kind of fractal decolonial model to kind of address that again what that looks like i don't know but it's i think it's i think it's the key is definitely there the key is not in yeah um well the key is not in lots of other places but yeah <laughs> that's probably me May I draw attention to something in the chat? Um, so Richard Solly is here in the audience. He's also from London Mining Network. He was one of the founders actually, and he's our coordinator. Um, and he, I came in later, even though I already knew him. Um, 
he says here, when we set up London Mining Network, we invited all the organisations we had worked with over many years to meet to discuss what we might do together. We spent about six months meeting repeatedly to decide what we had in common and what tasks we might do together despite our differences. LMN is what came out of this. Um, but even then, the focus was very much on working with communities affected by mining. And I guess there was some urgency. So like six months is a good time limit to set because there's some urgency to actually start working on the issues together. Um, but there was there had to be quite a lot. It can't come out of one big event or, um, you know, there has to be a sort of a focus and a purpose to those discussions over a period of time. I think Richard had his hand up, Gabriella. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Richard? Lee? Yes, there's a few Richards, aren't there? Um, I, I'm Richard Lee. I'm uh, one of the working group for the People's Land Policy that, that helped to uh, put on today's event. And I just wanted to mention something about uh, a next step that we that we are thinking about um, from those who organise today, and I think it does it does really combine some of the inspirations and advice that the three speakers have been uh, sharing with us. You know, in in terms of com combining together the the many radical impulses um, that are there now to really have system change, uh, but. Uh, but also to pick on these these points about uh, relationship building and uh, bringing people together and the different ways that you can do that. So what, what we are, would like to propose as a, a next step that we can offer uh, as kind of our contribution from people's land policy is to have a have an event where where we actually discuss a, a new project um, about how we build uh, a land reform movement uh, in the UK, and maybe we actually need to have a, a space where where not only not only do we um, look at uh, how we map and uh, uh, encourage relationships through those that types of mapping of the ecosystem and so on but also how we actually get to know each other better and how we have some experience of working together um and i i felt karima that you were in a way um talking about this type of method and it, se it seemed uh, so important that something that is missing at the moment um, in our society in terms of this important subject. So our, our suggestion is that we, we will invite everyone who's been to our seminars. And that's, that's a lot of people, actually, because I think this is about the 10th seminar that, that we've held under, under COVID. Um, and to inv to invite everyone uh, to an event that will that will actually discuss um, what is needed um, in order to build a land movement. Um, what are the possibilities? Um, what are the activities um, that we can work on together? Because really, I think we do have to get beyond just attending seminars and uh, map doing very good mapping you know we really have to get into the practice of working together um, uh, understanding each other better and having uh, common activities so we will in we are intending to invite everyone uh, to such an event uh, for that purpose and those who are left today it would be interesting quickly for us to to see whether you think this would be a, a good next step um, and whether it, this would complement very well uh, what Kate has described in terms of work of, of shared assets. Um, we hope it will, 
but uh, that that is uh, what we are thinking of something we can contribute I mean, yeah, I think that sounds like um, that sounds like a great idea. I think, um, yeah, I'm, um, yeah, super, yeah. Let's. I think it might be worth us, Richard, Richard and Bonnie, and us having a bit a bit of a wider chat because we've now got um, a new movement building coordinator on the team as well. So, um, yeah, uh, various things that we should probably see how we can best um, coordinate or be aware of at least if i could say that i think karima we there's a lot that we could learn from you actually <laughs> i mean already i've learned quite a lot but i think uh, really the way that you built things up i think is a good example to our, to us all really Thank you, Bonnie. Um, I think it's probably other people in LMN as well who should take uh, credit for this. I mean, it's we work together as a team and it'd be interesting if you wanted to talk to all of us sometime, that would be great. Okay, Gabriella. Hey. Yes, I'm just. I was just reading the chat because there's a lot of interesting <laughs> comments there. But yeah, I think that this is this is just a start, or, or I would say the continuation of an open conversation that should keep happening, as as we all said. Like we we cannot just keep. And Richard well pointed out, we cannot just stay on, on doing seminars without putting this into practice, going to the streets and also organizing our movements on the ground. This is a, a very important uh, aspect of this wide uh, collaboration. And I think that uh, having insights from colleagues all over the world, it's also very, very valuable. So I, I really thank uh, Tiago for, for being here and sharing his perspective and expertise as well in movement building in Brazil. And I think that from now on, uh, I think that other events and other convening spaces will be held and everyone is welcome to join as well. And probably people's land policy will keep reaching out to everyone so that this movement doesn't stop, right? This won't stop in one or two meetings or three seminars or even more. This is an ongoing uh, uh, process, right? That we are all sharing and learning here so that the movement can be even stronger in the defense of land. So I just wanted to thank you everyone that was here and hopefully we can keep the this international, actually transnational solidarity struggles very strong. So yes, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, it was great being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank yes, thank you.